He's the clinical professor of medicine and cardiology at Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit. Prolific writer, speaker, the author of The Whole Heart Solution, contributor to the Huffington Post and uh, Mind Body Green. Give it up, everyone, for America's healthy heart doctor, Dr. Joel Kahn. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, I am a cardiologist. I see patients four days a week, sometimes five. Uh, I see unbelievable, remarkable reversal of heart disease, prevention of heart disease. I'm going to give you a bit of a historical slice why this is so powerful. And as you know, amongst all the areas that plant-based medicine has made inroads, and there's so much more to do and, and actually study and research and report, because it is ultimately going to require scientific literature to sway medical schools, medical boards, uh, medical residencies and such. Um, but cardiology certainly wins the day, and the only sad note is that it isn't more prevalent. If we went to any cardiology fellowship in the United States and asked one question, who is Dean Ornish, I think the fail rate would be about 98%. And whether you know who Dr. Ornish is, you'll know in a minute, but uh, it's just you know, inexcusable and hopefully will be something we improve upon. Uh, so spread the word. So after starting cardiology training about 33 years ago, I am still completely in love with this amazing, amazing organ. In one sense, simple. It's just a pump with some valves, with some arteries on top, a little bit of fat. On the other hand, now we know it's got hormone systems and nervous systems and can regenerate and stem cells. But just a beauty, 50,000 miles of arteries in your body, you know, mindfulness. 50,000, twice around the world, and just your body is the uh, amount of arteries. And you know, every artery is lined with this wallpaper called the endothelium. The endothelium is like a wallpaper that protects against damage, but also produces many, many important substances, most notably nitric oxide, NO. That's why we eat our greens and we chew them and Dr. Esselstyn and our beets and we don't smoke and we don't eat olive oil, maybe. I'm not so sure that's completely true. I, I'm not so sure that nuts are bad. I'm not so sure that avocados are bad or olives. So I do have a little different practice. Certainly always whole foods, but nonetheless, just absolutely gorgeous. It, it is possible to be 90 and have the same arteries as 20. There are people, I will ultimately get to the topic. Uh, there was a study about two years ago in Lancet, a very prominent uh, British journal that they took, it's the coolest thing, they took a native tribe in Bolivia called the Chimane. Anybody here to the Chimane, T-S-I-M-A-N-E? I think that's a proper way you pronounce it. They put them in dugout canoes and took them to a hospital. That must have been a cultural shock to see all that processed food in the vending machines after eating native uh, wild foods. But they did it to do heart CT scans to look if this native tribe had as much coronary artery disease measured in this very accurate, silent uh, way as the Western population. And it is by far the most uh, coronary artery disease free population so far documented. Dr. Esselstyn talks about Papua New Guinea and the Haratuma uh, Indians in Mexico, but the Chimane are the winners. You can be 80 years old and have the arteries like this with high frequency. Their diet is largely plant-based. I think the calculations were about 85% of their calories come from plants. If they catch a lizard, they eat it. I mean, they're in the jungle, that's what they do. And uh, very naturally low in fat, about 15% of calories, very much like native Okinawa uh, and other populations. Fat isn't always bad, because the little people in Crete eat olive oil all day long and they have very little heart disease too, but I'll talk about that in a second. Absolutely stunning, normal, this by cardiac catheterization. This is the goal, good health. I have a button I've had for 40 years, happiness is clean arteries, that's a cardiology viewpoint. Um, it is usually very hard to know if you have clean arteries, but now, in the past 10 plus years, there's a CT scan, costs 75 to $100, that's what they did in the Bolivian tribe. Every hospital in New York has it, every hospital in Charlottesville has it, San Francisco, anywhere. And about age 45 or 50, it's a very good idea to get a calcium CT heart scan. This is Men's Health Month. I literally on the plane here this morning just to stress Tom Dunham out. I said I'd swear at least once and I'd come in just an hour before my talk to stress him out a little bit. But I wrote a blog about Men's Health Month urging men around age 45, 50 to get this heart CT scan to make sure that they look like this without actually having to do the catheterization inside. Uh, and if you eat plant-based, you're gonna favor that you end up like this. The earlier you start, 
Again, for me, it's been 42 years totally plant-based because the dormitory food in Ann Arbor was so awful. I switched then and never went back, and that's my profound story of transformation. Um, and, you know, it's called area under the curve. The longer you don't smoke, the less likely you get lung cancer. The longer you eat whole food, plant-based, the more likely you'll have gorgeous, gorgeous arteries. I wasn't always a sprout guy. I was a stent guy. That's me with the mustache and the white coat in 1989. The guy on the other end of the picture was the world's most famous angioplasty doc, Jeffrey Hartzer, Kansas City, where every restaurant was KC Masterpiece Barbecue. Somehow I found, you know, little salads and tomatoes and bean chilies here and there and survived a year. The guy in the middle is not so bad either. Uh, he's still with us. Unfortunately, Dr. Hartzer's passed. Dr. Rutherford from Auckland, New Zealand. And these guys could blast plaque apart. That was 1989. I started a job in 1990. I'll tell you why that's historically of value in a minute. We're in New York. It's almost New Jersey. My first love was Bruce Springsteen. Uh, and don't call your surgeon if he says it's too late. It's not your lungs this time. It's your heart that holds your fate from Asbury Park. Indeed, as you know, for 101 years, heart disease has been the number one cause of death in the United States and most Western countries. Cancer is right there always, and uh, there are some countries where cancer has overcome heart disease as the number one cause of death, but that's every single kind of cancer. Heart disease, we're talking predominantly clogged arteries that are largely lifestyle-related phenomenon. Uh, and it's so important to take this awesome database that I'll go through. Never could be big enough. We need much more. And this is what happens to those gorgeous clean arteries. All you get left is that little tiny slit. Everything else is filled in with cholesterol crystals and calcium crystals and fibrous tissue and collagen and cells, inflammation cells. And at some point, you either croak or you start to get short of breath, chest pain, leg pain, erectile dysfunction. TIAs, strokes, um, or maybe you just have this burden and you make it later in life. Winston Churchill lived in 91 as fat as he was, as smoking cigars, and undoubtedly had we checked him, if we put him in a dugout canoe, took him down the river and did a CT scan, which wasn't available in his lifetime, I'm sure he was clogged up, but he did make it to 91. It's a very, you know, the one person who's 102 and smokes and eats bacon doesn't deny the fact that you favor good health and longevity and freedom from developing this awful disease, which is not only preventable in most cases. Now, it isn't always so simple. There is a genetic input to heart disease. Some of you know who um, uh, Bob Harper is from The Biggest Loser, the trainer with Jillian Michaels. We know that his diet, which was at one point plant-based, shifted to more keto and bulletproof coffee, butter, coconut oil, coffee kind of stuff. And then he had a massive heart attack, but he went on the Oz show saying, I have a severe genetic cholesterol called lipoprotein little a, LP little a. It can clog your arteries even if you eat sprouts. As far as we know, I would eat the sprouts, but uh, we need advanced checks and, and complex workup. This is an angiogram. You can see a very narrowed part at the top uh, middle of the picture. That's a typical, quote, widow maker, LAD, front heart artery down to a pinpoint. This happens to be from the patient who had the first angioplasty in the world in 1977 in Zurich by a pioneer. I'll show you his picture. And we really, from then to now, have been very mechanically oriented in heart disease. We put tubes in people. I've done that a thousand times. We inject stuff. We put balloons. We shove bypasses. We cut people open. Never thinking really very hard or very long about what caused the problem in the first place, despite lots and lots of data both epidemiology, basic science, but medicine isn't coming to the bedside telling people, you just gotta play the record backwards and maybe we can undo this wicked problem. The other problem is we tend to pick it up when it's already this advanced and this severe, uh, undoubtedly it's been going on for a decade or more, uh, and sometimes you just have to move in with mechanical approaches, but they obviously are not the root cause. Nobody has a stent deficiency. Nobody needs a vein from their leg put in their heart because that's the normal situation. We just have such a crazy medical system that we pick people up at the very end. This is just historical for the fun of it. There is a connection to the plant-based world. The shorter gentleman, Dr. Mason Soans from the Cleveland Clinic, a medical doctor, radiologist, was actually taking pictures in 1959 of people's aortas because it was felt if you ever took a picture of heart arteries directly, you'd die instantly, and it was a reasonable thought. 
but accidentally one day his catheter fell in somebody's heart artery. He got this gorgeous picture of a heart artery. The patient didn't die, and he had the wisdom to say, maybe we should do this routinely. So there are now millions and millions of people that get that. The taller guy is a uh, Argentinian surgeon now passed on, Rene Favalaro. He did the first bypass in the world at the Cleveland Clinic in 1969. But he shared a locker with Dr. Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic. Esselstyn's an E, Favalero's an F. There was a period where they had to share a locker because of some construction. And they became good buddies, and that was a major influence on Esselstyn shifting from a career of thyroid and breast evaluation to uh, researching and being focused on heart disease and the world's a better place for that, so thank you, Dr. Favalaro. That's Dr. Grunzig, a dapper, magnetic individual with an amazing mind and hands. He fortunately also had an ego that was too big, so he flew his private plane in a storm in 1985 in Atlanta and crashed in a mountain and died at age 43, way too young with his lovely, lovely, even younger wife. So despite decades of science of the causes of cardiovascular disease, number one killer of men and women, we just sit back and let it all be, as Springsteen said. And then I'm done with Springsteen. I have another talk where I use it over and over, but we'll just leave it alone after this. I am on staff at two hospitals in Detroit. One, when I walk in the lobby with the name Harper University Hospital, has a Wendy's. First thing you see, not registration, is the Wendy's right there and the Chick-fil-A right there. Obviously, we've let it all be and lost our soul. And just to keep up with it, the other hospital I'm on staff at has decided to put in a Wahlburgers, which is just a Burger King with a handsome 48-year-old uh, LA actor, of course, Mark Wahlberg and his brother. Nothing like what Chad Sarno is doing with plant-based tuna, uh, a healthy thing. Uh, and it's just awful. So we got to do better. And it results in you know, comical but very sad and very real pictures like this. And you know, this is in a hospital. Uh, just like the ones that I practice in. The, we don't have McDonald's, we have Wendy's and uh, other awful places. One of the clues, besides a lot of basic science and Nobel Prize, was that this list that comes out every year and every five, every 10 years, causes of death in the United States, was analyzed for really more the root cause in a very simple way, not necessarily from a lab value, biochemical way. But there's three things that cause 90% of the deaths in the United States. It's smoking or not smoking, it's regular fitness or not regular fitness, and it's good or poor diet choices, or processed or unprocessed diet choices, or animal heavy or animal unheavy diet choices. And as Dr. Stoll said, we've got to be careful about falling in a trap of very processed plant-based foods. They proliferate, they're a joy once in a while, but they're not gonna be the solution to the pollution that we get in our body. So with this idea that as Dr. David Katz, a Yale Griffin Preventive Medicine program says you fork your fingers and your feet, you fork what you eat, your fingers if you smoke, your feet if you move. We control the three F's in life, the levers that control our health, along with love, stress, and sleep, to finish out the Dean Ornish component of it all. But that could we therefore develop programs that control tobacco, control diet, control activity, and actually identify a, a reversal, a prevention, uh, once we understood you know, these large macro causes of disease. Can we go backwards? Better yet, can we prevent and never get to the point of these pinpoints in our 50,000 miles of arteries that manifest as chest pain, shortness of breath, sudden death, heart attack, stroke, TIA, the very feared erectile dysfunction that is uh, ignored as a sign of cardiovascular disease and a clue, but uh, is a very real and important one. You know, it's a blue pill, it's not a blueberry, unfortunately, and it's not a heart evaluation, unfortunately, which is recommended, but it's just not practiced. So this is a fun little timeline. If you go over 1939, I'm not gonna dive into it. Some of you via Michael Greger, nutritionfacts.org, will know who Dr. Walter Kempner, a German immigrant, MD, who ultimately came to Duke University at a time it was a tiny little backwater medical center, developed a diet of, of very low fat and fruit and rice, and began to report amazing results with limiting animal foods and fats. And it was called Duke Rice Diet, became a money maker and built Duke Medical Center into the big behemoth it is nowadays, but suggested this ability of diet to really impact disease dramatically, even though it is a bit of a crazy diet. There is the doors. The doors did nothing that I know about for heart disease 
but it is supposed to be Dr. Lester Morrison, and for reasons I don't understand, I'm going to tell you about him in a minute. His picture is hard to find, and I'll go through some of the others in a minute. But I do want you to know about this Dr. Lester Morrison. Lester Morrison was an internist in Los Angeles. He's passed on now. He looked at some of the data that I'll show you in a minute about Dr. Esselstyn that some countries like Norway during World War II were reported to have had a drop in deaths despite the challenge, the difficulty, the conditions of being an occupied country in World War II. And one of the thoughts was that their diet changed dramatically during World War II. Greasy, fatty, prince-like, king-like food was taken back to Germany and people were left to eat simple foods out of the gardens and the forests and became foragers. There was also difficulty getting cigarettes, so that influenced it too. So he created this awesome diet that any of us would probably give to any patient with obesity, diabetes, heart disease nowadays you know, get rid of egg yolks, get rid of creams, get rid of cheeses, get rid of processed white flour foods, the awful whites ahead of his time. He doesn't want you using olive or vegetable oils if you're in his clinic. Again, he was an internist in 1948. Treatment of heart disease was essentially nitroglycerin pills. And then you see at the bottom, just to mimic a diet that was described in Europe, Norway, uh, he eliminated rich whole foods. No olives, no nuts, no avocados. I believe this is probably where to this day, patients walk in my office quaking and ask me, can I eat an olive ever if it's in water, brine, not oil? And you know, it goes back, I believe, because what happened is he published data. He took 100 patients with severe heart disease in Los Angeles. He told 50 of them, just continue to eat what you're eating, continue to be my patient. And he asked 50 of them if they would adhere to this program. And he published the data, so this is not you know, anecdote. He published it in a major health journal. He showed that the weight went down on the 50 that followed this program. Cholesterol fell dramatically from over 300 under 200 just with diet alone. People reported more vitality and energy and mental clarity and improved symptoms. But this is what's really striking. Dr. Lester Morrison published, if you look at 12 years, none of the people that had their diet unaltered that had any intervention were still alive and half of his patients, so 25 of 50, that adopted that list, that very famous list of, you know, what do you got left if you take away those foods? Largely fruits, vegetables, lean uh, meats of any kind, uh, if any, and uh, whole grains uh, and such. So Dr. Lester Morrison, there is an auditorium at the Senior Society Medical Center in Los Angeles named after him. I had the pleasure of giving grand rounds there about a year and a half ago. Nobody in the audience knew who it was. Uh, he went on to do other research on reversing heart disease um, with um, chelation kind of approaches and wrote some books. But he had a major influence, and one of the influences he had was on Mr. Nathan Pritikin, who is the gentleman under the 1970 uh, marker. Mr. Nathan Pritikin, many of you may know the name from the Pritikin Longevity Center, it used to be in Santa Monica, now it exists and is very robust in Miami at the Doral Country Club. But he was a, a biospace engineer in Santa Barbara. He had many patents, I believe about 40. He was building parts in World War II for airplanes for our defense system. Uh, and he heard in the early 50s, because it was in the papers, that there was this guy in Los Angeles, Dr. Morrison, who was dropping people's cholesterol and was uh, showing some promise for heart disease. And just one of these people that was not limited to engineering and limited to airplanes. And he went down to Los Angeles, had his own blood drawn, and his cholesterol was over 300. He was at that time quite hefty, 45 years old, loved hot dogs, loved ice cream. Um, and then Dr. Morrison said, just uh, go up and down some stairs and I'll repeat your electrocardiogram, which is what a stress test was in 1955. And he flunked it. And Dr. Morrison said, you'll be dead just like my charts here unless you take this sheet and follow it. And that even wasn't enough because Pritikin did follow it and dropped his cholesterol um, to about 120, it's reported. But he just started diving in any medical literature and said, I'm going to develop a program and teach us. This is too good not to share, even though I'm not a medical doctor. And he got tremendous pushback. He had to find some doctors to work with him. He started writing articles, actual science articles, There's books like these that sold millions of copies, got on 60 Minutes, opened this treatment center, and actually published data that showed that he could you know, work to eliminate obesity, high blood pressure, 
diabetes, uh, cholesterol, and improve cardiac outcome, usually with a three-week inpatient program. Come stay with us for three weeks. That is a program that's still available in Miami, and I'll tell you in a minute, it will, for some people, is actually paid for by their insurance to live at the Pritikin Center for three weeks. So a very humble man. I'm just trying to wipe out heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. Thank goodness he had the energy to pursue that. I just want to spend a minute or two, not usually identified as a plant-based warrior, because he wasn't, but Dr. Ansel Keys had two PhDs and then settled in Minneapolis at the university in a lab under the football stadium. That's the only place they could find for him in the late 30s. Had a keen interest in nutrition, and actually an interest in fasting and starvation. But uh, he developed a theory that he thought that the rise in heart attacks that he identified and reported, and it was happening in Minneapolis in the late 40s and early 50s, was due to changes in diet and was due to probably animal food and fat content. That was a very novel theory at the time and very controversial, and he developed some reason to believe. But he ultimately designed a study, maybe you've heard of, seven country study, he is the shortest gentleman at the end of these four. The gentleman, the third over with the white mustache, is the head of cardiology from Harvard, Paul Dudley White. This is about 1956. It's in a little village in Italy, and they decided they were going to find 12,000 men around the world, very different situations. Japan and their native diet, Croatia and their native diet, a couple places in the United States and their native diet, little villages in Italy and their native diet, Crete, which is why I mentioned Crete and olive oil and their native diet. They were actually going to bring their food back to Minneapolis and analyze it scientifically, not just take histories on people, and follow these people and see if countries with higher constituents from animal foods and fats had different heart disease rates, which was emerging as the number one cause of death in the Western world when this study was launched in 1958 and first phase completed in 1970 and published literally, there's so much data like a book. Indeed, you've probably never seen data from the seven country study, which again, 1970 first publication, but there's now 50 year follow-up being published. If you look over where it says Northern Europe, cholesterol levels in the blood average over 300 and CHD is coronary heart disease or heart attack death rates highest in the Western world and certainly highest in these countries, 16 communities in seven countries. And if you go over the other side, Japan, native serum blood cholesterol is 120, 130, lowest coronary heart disease rate, certainly an apparent trend. Northern Europe was Finland, they ate an enormous amount of butter, an enormous amount of sausage, and had saturated fat rates about 25 to 30 uh, percent in their diet. So they focused at first on dietary fat in general, then they realized polyunsaturated vegetable oil plant-based fats were actually not harmful, which is why Crete, and they drank olive oil like water in Crete, and 40 percent of their calories are from olive oil, they just didn't have heart disease. But in Finland, where they were eating fats from animal sources, so they focused later on saturated fat. So if you look at the bottom, some countries had up to 25% of their calories from saturated fat. The current recommendation in the United States should be under 7%, under 6%, uh, really as low as tolerated. They had very high heart disease rates. And this is 25 years follow-up. There are some 50-year studies now. And the countries that had low saturated fat intake had very low heart disease. These are called associations. This wasn't a randomized study. But at the time, this was being done before computers, you know, very difficult work all over the world with little funding, amazing, amazing science. Ansel Keys gets a shout out for identifying food choices matter, and since saturated fat is largely found in animal-based foods with the exception of coconut and palm oil, it certainly is supportive of reducing or eliminating animal foods high in fat, uh, which is going to be most of them. Dr. Ornish will be here tomorrow. He's talking on the general spectrum of lifestyle, I believe. It's a huge honor to talk about heart disease when He's going to be here, He's, but truly an amazing, intrepid warrior that gets credit, but he doesn't get the credit he should get for 40 years. I'll show you uh, 40 years of working. And his famous paradigm is, what's wrong with the medical system? The sink's overflowing. People are having heart attacks, strokes, erectile dysfunction, amputations, and we have great operations, and we have great stents, and we have lasers, and we have amazing medication. But what's causing the problem in the sink is not getting the focus. It's not getting the funding. And it's just basically 
uh, as silly as you know people falling off a waterfall and crashing on the rocks and having ambulances and nobody puts up a fence to uh, avoid the tragedy in the first place. And we haven't done that much better in the 40 years of his career. So few people have seen this, they've seen other data, but actually an abstract was published in 1979 and then the full article published in a very famous medical journal by Dr. Dean Ornish, where he had this idea, you know, Pritikin's out there, Morrison's out there, um, Dr. Walter Kempner's out there. We're gonna take really sick heart patients and we're gonna lock them in a hotel and we're gonna give them the food they're gonna eat, which is gonna be whole food, plant-based uh, food. We're gonna teach them stress management and stretching and yoga and walking. 23 other patients similar were not in that program. And they found within just three weeks and three days, their ability to exercise dramatically increased more than medication will typically do it. There was no cholesterol medicine like Lipitor used in this study but their cholesterol levels dropped in just 24 days, and their symptoms of heart disease, angina pain, went down this remarkable 91%. He got this published in one of the more premier journals. He was, uh, I think, a medical student when he did the actual study, probably 24, 25 years old when this was published. I mean, remarkable, precocious researcher, came from a, a good family in Dallas and trained at Baylor and Harvard and ultimately moved to San Francisco, Sausalito. But people were quite, quite skeptical if they knew of this data. So he went back and did his residency after medical school, but got funding to do a, a more formal randomized study called the Lifestyle Heart Trial, though he talks more about lifestyle medicine now than uh, it being just a heart trial. He got 48 patients, very severe heart disease. He got them to agree to have an angiogram and a certain kind of stress test called a PET scan stress test and come back at one year and five years, even if they were doing fine, to see how their catheterization data were doing, the most sophisticated analysis to this day that's still available. Half of them went on the same program these people were in, locked in a hotel, but now they were allowed to be at home, but in order to keep them on track, they had support groups and phone calls and such. That's always important, community support. I'll talk about that at the very end. And half of them were allowed to follow a general healthy diet without specific advice that their personal physician would recommend. This is the publication, July 21, 1990. I'd been in practice three weeks with my balloons and my Kansas City training, eating my plants now for about 13 years. But uh, I saw this article and I didn't know who Dr. Ornish was. I don't know how many people did in 1990, but I knew the other authors were very prominent academic world famous docs and just went through and said, this is you know, friggin' remarkable that the control group in one year, their cholesterol was 157 LDL, meaning their total cholesterol probably was 250. It dropped without medication, just with lifestyle. Even yoga and meditation dropped cholesterol, but certainly, and he showed it. This was predominantly due to the diet changes, eating whole food, plant-based diets. Progression, disease at one year got worse and half the people on control less than 20% if they ate and de-stressed well. And regression, meaning this is really the first time this was ever shown with really good technology. Regression, the majority of the people that followed the Ornish program, their arteries, at least in some spots, looked better, measured by a computer, not by an eyeball, very objective. So on average, the amount of blockage at one year was 2% less in the experimental group and 3% worse. And that's why I tell every patient in my office, you've gotten worse since last year unless you've done that. You've actually gotten worse unless you've seen me in the last year to keep you on track. You're getting worse, you're aging if you have a burden of atherosclerosis already. Five-year data was published, again, in prominent journal JAMA. Dr. Dean Ornish, lead author, got these people to commit to continue to follow their program, either the control program or the intensive lifestyle program. And this is probably the most important slide in lifestyle cardiology I'm aware of, which is baseline catheterization, one-year catheterization, five-year catheterization, heart artery analysis by computer, stenosis means amount of narrowing. These two groups started identical. The average amount of narrowing in their arteries was 41%. These are just heart arteries, not all 50,000 miles of arteries, but very important arteries. They are ready at one year, but very prominently at five years. The control group in black circles got worse, and now we're 51% blocked, and the intensive lifestyle treatment group were getting better and better and better. And there is no other program in the world that has any data like this. There's no 
Mediterranean diet data, there's no ketogenic diet data, there's no Whole30 data, there's no paleo data, uh, there's no uh, Scandinavian diet data, all these are kind of popular out there now, even the DASH diet. Uh, it's a difficult study to do. It's a little easier nowadays with certain CT technology. It's still an issue of funding and lack of interest in diet and lifestyle, but remarkable data that, as I say right here, should have been game over. You know, we have a very, very lethal disease of high frequency. We have an inexpensive and effective treatment. We have modalities that require slashing your chest open, putting in balloons, which at the time were a very crude way to treat heart disease. Stents improved the outcome, but you had to take powerful medication for very long periods of time and did nothing to alter the progression of the disease throughout the body. We have a treatment. How much excitement was there in 1990 and 1998? I don't recall anybody ever talking about it through any of my training at universities and other places, and we didn't have plantrician projects and meetings like this to celebrate the data. But fortunately, there are some bright lights of progress. Dr. Stoll mentioned this. It took till 2010. Remember, one of the studies was published in 1983, then 1990, then 1998. Mr. Pritikin's data was in the 70s and 80s. It took you know, nearly 20 years that Medicare said, we are impressed that you've ultimately showed us big numbers. Ornish data grew to thousands. Pritikin data grew to thousands in actual scientific publications. You've shown us economic saving. It costs us, Medicare, less money to train a person in the Ornish and Pritikin lifestyle program over the course of the next five, 10 years. We will pay. So to this day, if you've had a heart attack recently, a stent recently, a bypass recently, uh, are having angina, you can be approved to go to a Pritikin program, the official ones in Doral Country Club Miami, but other hospitals now franchise it and have it in their hospital. We have only one in the state of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and you can do the same thing at an Ornish program. And within a few weeks, you cook, you meditate, you uh, exercise, you have social support, you get educated, and hopefully you're set on your way to follow the same you know, positive outcome that these studies showed. So uh, sadly, it's actually very profitable if you're involved in your hospital's politics or administration. It's much more profitable to have these cardiac rehab programs uh, because the reimbursement is about double compared to standard cardiac rehab. But it takes a little effort and focus and some loud champion. And in my city of Detroit of four million, there isn't one hospital, despite much discussion, that's uh, taken the bull by the horn and added it on. It's not possible to mention this you know, amazing uh, attempt to stem this serious, serious disease without mentioning Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, you know, Olympic uh, medalist, uh, army doc, and then ultimately a prominent surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, and because in part at least that locker experience with Dr. Favalero, ENF, he got interested and he read and he read and he read and ultimately went to the cardiac group. I'm not a cardiologist, but if you've got people that can't be treated at the world famous Cleveland Clinic, the busiest cardiac uh, surgical center in the world, my wife and I want to cook for these people and treat these people and I'll track the data and see if I can help them. I think I got something. That's the graph of Norway during World War II and the drop in overall death for about three years when life was tough and food was spare. Sparse. I think I've probably moved 500 to 1,000 copies of that book. It's the book I ask my patients to read. I tell them this is, you know, the strictest approach to heart disease. Not all of them have heart disease as bad as the cohort that Dr. Esselstyn has studied and published and Dr. Ornish studied and published. But I want them to get it, you know, the purest, the purest, the purest uh, Bible to read. Half the book is recipes. It hasn't gone out of date. Um, and you know, it remains hugely helpful uh, and changes lives, and I'm sure it saves lives uh, without a doubt. The couple examples that are in the literature that anybody can look at from Dr. Esselstyn's research, this uh, very badly blocked LAD is the name of a heart artery, and three years later the artery looks brand new. That's not stent, that's not bypass, that's not chelation, unless you call plant-based foods chelation, which it might be but it's the remarkable power of taking away the, nox the noxious endothelial damaging components of Western life and putting in the healthy ones. And the arrow at 1987 points to a pinched part of a right coronary uh, that's basically been rebuilt 
with sprouts. So it's sprouts, not stents. I own the trademark Prevent Not Stent TM. Uh, we could do it sprouts, not stents TM. Stents are wonderful if you're in the midst of a heart attack, but for the vast majority of people, they will never hear that this is available, scientifically proven, and possibly even uh, intense program would be paid for by their own uh, insurance company. Uh, most people you know, point to these older pictures in very important pictures to make the case. I have the insane experience in my clinic in Detroit. Every week I see you know, half a dozen people where I document that their plaque is melting away. If you just look for a minute, this is carotid ultrasound analyzed with a computer, digitized, it's called a CIMT. It's non-invasive, it's ultrasound, it's read at a university, so I'm not the one. But in the course of a year, this 45-year-old man came back a year later, and as you see, I wrote in how big his plaques were in his carotids a year before. 2.3 went down to 2.0, 3.3 fell in half to 1.5. 4.9 fell by 80% to 1.5, and the other one also down 50%. There's another measurement there that said at age 45, some measurement was like a 41-year-old now, it's like a 34-year-old. You can take plant, whole food diet, stress management, exercise, eliminate smoking, and a few other tricks that I won't talk about because they involve vitamins, and you can make this stuff go away, and I see it over and over. And if you follow me on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, and I hope you do, because you'll find all the other great plant-based heroes that I tag, and we tag each other in the medical world, in the fitness world, in the food industry world. Um, you'll see that I post these. I don't see anybody else posting these in the entire world. It's unbelievably you know, narcotic, exciting effect to actually see this happening. Um, you know, some are on Lipitor. I'm not going to tell you none are. Their cholesterol is 400, I'm not giving them solely beets. I can't do that. They're a thing called lawyers and science. So Dr. Williams, Kim Williams, who I hope you recognize the name now, the head of cardiology at Rush University in Chicago and former president of the American College of Cardiology. You know, you can argue honestly and powerfully, yet very frustratingly, that you simply haven't read the data if you're a doctor involved in prevention and if you're a cardiologist. I don't care if a cardiologist said, forks over knives, and let the patient figure out what the heck that is and watch that DVD, or possibly said, prevent and reverse heart disease, uh, Esselstyn, or had a library in their waiting room. They don't have to do much. That's what I did for years, is spent about one minute of my eight minutes and said forks over knives and wrote it on a prescription pad and wrote down either a Dr. Ornish book, now he's got a new one called Undo It, which is pretty remarkable, or Dr. Esselstyn, or Dr. Bernard, or Dr. McDougall, or depending on the disease, and their state. Very small print, but I want to bring you up to date. In this great city, New York University, published in October, where the results, these are difficult studies. They took 100 patients with calf-proven heart disease, kind of like the uh, Ornish program, and they only looked at one measure, but it's an important measure. The measure is a blood test called HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Very important in understanding a patient's status, whether they're in inflamed or not inflamed into their blood vessel disease. They put half of them on a whole food, plant-based, vegan diet. Half of them went on the American Heart Association diet, which is way superior to the standard American diet. And they looked at this blood marker. Participants were given, they weren't put in a hotel, but they were given some groceries to get them going and get them on this year-long program, ambitious project, expensive project and such. And they did find adherence was high. In fact, people seemed to enjoy the plant diet even more than the American Heart Association diet and were quite compliant. If you look at the two bars in the upper third of the slide, the one that's down more than the other is the amount that the HSC reactive protein, high sensitivity C reactive protein, fell on the plant-based diet with no change in a statistical sense on the American Heart diet. You know, if you would have put a third bar, which is people eating like a cardiac surgeon in the doctor's dining room, you would have seen C-reactive protein high, high, high. And no offense if there is a plant-based surgeon or a plant-based cardiac surgeon in the audience, because God bless you, we need you, and you're smarter than 99% of your peers. Quick little conversation, if you need more ammunition, why whole food plant-based diet, uh, I'm meeting at this meeting some whole food plant-based gastroenterologists. I'm excited about that because people ask me and I'm not sure even nationwide who to refer to. There is a field and it's, it's emerging though it's not new and a term I'd like you to know then you can go read on your own. 
metabolic endotoxemia. You might recognize the word toxin in the middle of that, endotoxin. Endotoxin is uh, you know, an inside toxin, not an exotoxin. Turns out our microbiome with all those trillions and trillions and trillions of bacteria in our colon predominantly um, can release bacterial products some of them from gram-negative bacteria in the setting of shock, septic shock can kill us, literally. These products lower our blood pressure, shut our kidneys down, destroy our lungs. But even one meal can release a excessive burden of these products from gram-negative bacteria in our colon, and that's called metabolic endotoxemia. Uh, it causes inflammation, and it's believed to be linked to very serious diseases, including my main focus cardiovascular disease, obesity, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But if you look in the, it's a slide, those orange boxes are supposed to be these cells in your gut, the enterocytes that are locked next to each other with tight junctions. But if you eat diets full of processed foods, maybe full of Roundup glyphosate from uh, foods that have been destroyed by our food industry and are uh, either genetically modified or have been treated like a lot of wheat is treated with Roundup, even if it is not uh, GMO wheat, because there is no GMO wheat, doesn't mean there isn't glyphosate wheat. Nonetheless, you can injure those cells, they open up, and LPS is another name for endotoxin, lipopolysaccharide, or little pieces of shit, if you wanna do it that way. And it can get in your bloodstream, and it can cause inflammation, a whole cascade, and it's believed to cause inflammation in blood vessels, in the liver, and fat tissues. So there's this cascade, if you look at the lower left, what stimulates this more than anything is actually very high fat diets. So Take a, a, a milkshake, give it to a volunteer, and measure the amount of endotoxin in their blood an hour later, it goes way up. If you give them a glass of orange juice full of sugar, and I'm no fan of sugar, it doesn't go up. Sugar's a problem, but this is a fat-related problem, and you'll see probably the worst fat, I'll show you in a minute. It changes the gut flora, it causes the leak of these lipopolysaccharide endotoxins, and this is you know, hugely central medicine science. Well, what doesn't cause this? Whole food, plant-based diets won't trigger this cascade, which is why your patients or you or people you know will feel better pretty quickly. That's why brain fog goes away because you no longer have inflammation of blood-brain barrier necessarily and why just joints and ultimately heart uh, issues and the high sensitivity C-reactive protein improve. In a study in pigs, and I'll just real quick look at that uh, brown bar, Coconut oil induced the release of endotoxin in the blood of pigs more than any other fat studied. Olive oil and saline were about the same. Coconut oil is extremely high, as you know, 82%, 85% saturated fat, even though it's a plant fat. It's not a whole food, it's a processed food. So there is some reason, uh, even if you are enjoying an occasional olive, walnut, avocado, and most of you should, unless you're you know, an end-stage heart patient, really struggling with it, and I would be very adherent to uh, exactly how Dr. Ornish, Dr. Morrison, Dr. Esselstyn and such uh, uh, present the proper diet. But I'd be wary of uh, you know bulletproof coffee, coconut oil, put it on your skin, use it in the bedroom, just don't eat it. Very quick kind of wrap up, it isn't all that complex. Our government 2011 published this as compared to the previous pyramid. Pretty attractive food plate, half of it fruits and vegetables, another quarter grains, doesn't say meat, so protein's beans, protein is uh, lentils, protein is peas, protein is greens, chlorella, I eat chlorella as a food, but it is indeed a weird thing to do, it tastes pretty good. But they promoted we drink eight glasses of dairy a day. But it was still an advance and just a colorful, easy thing. Harvard School of Public Health a few months later said, you know, you got lobbyists that influence that. We're relatively unassociated with any lobbyists and influence. Let's just clean it up a little. Let's leave vegetables and fruits half your plate. Let's call it whole grains, because we don't want people eating donuts and saying they're following the US food plate. There is grains and donuts, but they're refined, of course, in cookies and cakes. Just go back to Morrison this healthy protein. So we're not going to be eating processed meats. Uh, we're not going to be eating, you know, cold cuts. We're going to talk about, it says beans, poultry, fish. I'd be very fine with just the beans and such. The milk goes away. We're drinking black teas, black coffee. And we know now up to 25 cups of coffee a day is not uh, damaging to the stiffness of your arteries, a rather remarkable headline. There was nobody in the study drinking 25 cups of coffee a day, but they got worldwide press, a research 
study by including such a bizarre headline that was in the news this week. You can see they're okay with healthy oils, because I guarantee you it's better to drink olive oil than it is to do butter and lard and ghee. Stay active. We don't need to do anything more. If we could get schools and hospitals and uh, colleges to put this everywhere and teach this, health in America and England and Australia and Spain would just blossom, but you know, that's not the American food plate. Canada introduced a beautiful updated food plate about two months ago after not having had a new discussion in about 13 years. You can just see it's just so gorgeously presented. No, it's not completely whole food plant-based. You know, we have to have public policies that reach the mass number of people, and as much as the plant-based movement is growing, it's not going to reach 5% of the American public in the next five years. But this hopefully will reach through dietitians and hospitals and doctors and become policy in schools. Uh, and such, you know, a large percentage of people in Canada, an absolutely reasonable and gorgeous way to present a very logical approach, except if you're a heart disease reversal patient where you might want to be a little more adherent. All of that is actually a shout out to Dr. Neil Bernard and Physician Committee Responsible Medicine in 2009, because two years before our government adopted it, they had published this fully plant-based food plate, which is the one that I eat off of and many of you eat off of, and we know uh, properly, you know, properly prepared as close to natural sources, avoiding hyper-processed food is a wonderful way to sustain health uh, and maybe a little B12 sprinkled on top for the heck of it. So at one point in Detroit, I was on a billboard pitching uh, plant-based diets for heart disease and cancer and diabetes reversal. We've learned that indeed there's more data than ever. I have wrote a blog about two months ago. It was a very bad month in May to be a butcher because the rate of data that just keeps coming out, despite the growth of this wacko carnivore movement that I encountered in Paleo FX in Austin, despite, you know, but it's not a grass-fed beef study when they pound down huge data sets over and over about certainly processed meats being associated with colorectal cancer, uh, diabetes, heart failure, and coronary disease, but probably meats in general when you understand TMAO and inflammation and uh, the uh, insulogenic effect of meat is just not a real good food in large amount, and maybe not a real good food at all. So again, seeing the vendors are here. One minute on community. Five and a half years ago in Detroit, Michigan, a man named Paul Chatlin called me and said, you don't know me, I live in Detroit, but six months earlier, I was in the Cleveland Clinic waiting to have bypass surgery at age 55 the next morning, and somebody whispered in my ear, Esselstyn. And I got on my phone and I read that night about Esselstyn and I checked out of the Cleveland Clinic, never had heart surgery, met with him, became his protege. I eat perfect, but nobody understands what I'm doing and I'm very lonely because I don't know anybody in Detroit eating this way. I read my ingredients and if the sixth thing says soybean oil, I won't eat it and Kroger's and Albertsons are full of things like that, it's tough. So I said, yes, Paul, I know 10 patients in my practice that follow the, the diet as rigidly as you do and need to. And we had a meeting and 150 people showed up in February 2014. Fast forward, we said, let's do this more often. We now in Detroit have a group called Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group, but it's pbnsg.org. It has 6,500 members in Detroit. We have about 35 little groups that meet once a month for a potluck, 10 people, 20 people. And then we get together. This is Rip Esselstyn preaching engine two. Uh, whole food uh, lore to, you know, 700, 800 people. And any city can do this because it's really, it was a, you know, just a crazy wild prophet named Paul Chatlin, uh, prophet in that he also took some of his own funds to get it started. We really don't have really any funding. We do this at a high school. The hospital did actually threw us out after two meetings. You guys are just too wild and crazy. You're talking about health through food. We don't understand that. So we've never been able to get back to a hospital, but such be it, at one point we will. And it took a supportive doctor, who puts frankly very little time into it, a nice website. Chicago, Dr. Steve Loam and the group at Rush now has a group up and going, and there are a number of others, but your town needs us, whether it's just servicing 20 people, 100 people, put an ad in the paper, get on the radio, don't spend any money, get a room, watch Forks Over Knives, get a doctor, a nurse, a dietitian, an exercise fitness person who's whole food plant-based, give a little talk. You can, Dr. Khan at ConCenter.com. We actually have an 80-page guide how to set up one of these in your community. It is the juice that makes it all run. 
Uh, and the future of cardiology is to fully understand this word forks over knives. It wasn't a knife at the dinner table. It was intended by Brian Wendell to be the surgical knife being beaten down like the uh, plowshare and such in the biblical verse by forks and spoons that we use to eat properly. So thank you for presenting, you know, 70 years of the science in the future. Uh, frustrating that we have not gotten as far as we should be, but I think, again, uh, more than ever, I, I don't think it's the medical community that's actually going to lead this. It's the food industry, it's universities, it's Gen X and millennials. They're adopting some version, occasionally, of it being whole food plant-based, sometimes a little junkier than ideal. And uh, I think the future is very bright. James Cameron, the director of Avatar and Titanic, said this week, that whole food plant-based industry is like the internet in 1994. You know, grab on anywhere you can, it's about to explode and we're seeing that everywhere. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.